Thank you. Thank you very much. So a couple of things. I'd like to start off with a question. And the basic question is right here at the top. How can on care for our common home, called Laudato Si, I can explain what that means. So the Pope's document, on care for our common home, become a world vision. Okay. One might ask a deeper ethical question, do we want it to become a world vision? I hope by the time I get done today, you will at least consider that as a possibility. Okay, so I will know that I've done my work well if what I say impels you to want to know more. Okay, so a little bit of background. I grew up in the Northwest. I was born in Portland. My father went to the University of Portland. Mom got what she called her PhD degree. That's putting hubby through, putting hubby through college because while he was going to college, somebody needed to bring money in so little one and big ones could eat. Well, she did that quite well, God bless her. So then I moved up to Bremerton and that's where my dad had his career when he was working for the Department of the Navy, Department of Defense in Bremerton, Navy town. And we've been to Bremerton, you know where that is? Not, yeah, right across from Seattle. Very, very different character from Seattle. Okay, so um, what got me into ecology? I was a Boy Scout in the early 1970s, and I remember I went on my first hike, and it was to Camp Pleasant in the Olympic Mountains. And I was about 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, and I remembered when I finished that hike, I liked hiking. It was an overnight hike. I thought that was really cool. And so I realized that if I was going to continue to do hiking, probably better to turn off the hot water because when I'm out on the camping trip, I'm not going to warm water just to wash my hands. So that's the first ethical, ecological decision that I really made in my life. I was going to quit using hot water to wash my hands. Safety issues, or if it's really cold out, well, there's, of course, a change. And then I made other changes, little things. I mean, 12-year-olds don't tend to make huge ethical changes. But I made this one little change. So is that an ethical decision? Anybody? Does that sound like an ethical decision? Is it possible that it could be an ethical decision? Yeah, it's an ethical decision. Okay, so at 12 years old, I'm now 57. I've kept up with that ethical decision ever since. Okay, small things. That's one of the things we'll be talking about with Pope Francis is if we're going to make major changes, it's best to start off in small ways, in small but significant ways. Okay, so a 12 year old, by the way, I went on and I became an Eagle Scout. Thank you, Lord. And I've discovered that in, um, in the history of Mount Angel Abbey, I've monk, been a monk there for 30 years, a little over 30 years. There's only been, so far as I can tell, two Eagle Scouts. The other was Abbot Joseph, who died a few years ago. Abbot Abba, father. He was the one who, who led the community back in the late 1990s, early 2000s. Okay, so only 270 monks have died from there. Only one of those, Abbot Joseph, was an Eagle Scout, and I will be the second, thanks be to God. So, of course, when I became an Eagle Scout, economics and it was mostly ecology was a big issue. I ended up I remember getting the ecology, ecological studies merit badge, okay? And then kept going from there, became a mountain climber, just loved to be outside and to study ecology. I've been blessed to study it in, on three different continents where I've lived. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa, and then I've also li lived in Europe. And so, thanks be to God. Give me some, some world perspective. Okay, let's integrate this talk into the Monmouth setting here. I was actually a student here a little over 20 years ago. I think it was around 1993, 94. I took one class on critical thinking. Cretane, the Greek word, means to judge. Critical thinking means judging accurately. Okay, I take it that's, that's no secret for people who study at a um, university dedicated to education. Okay, so that's what I was studying critical thinking. And I remembered that 
Western Oregon University, over its history, has had seven different names. Well, when I looked up on Wikipedia, one name jumped out at me. Anybody guess what that might be, if you know the names? How, what's that? O-C-E. Oregon College of Education. Would you believe Christian College? That was, one of, that was the second name. It was Monmouth University was the first name. The second one was Christian College. Apparently two schools had joined together. I oh, we thought, well, that was rather intriguing. Okay, so I would suspect it's been since 1865 when that cha- name change took place. Um, probably not a lot of Christian education has taken place here. And I'm simply going to talk about Christianity. I'm not here to proselytize. I'm not here to you know, convince somebody to, to follow a Christian path. I think it's a particularly good path. But then the best way that we found in the Catholic tradition to talk about it is to live it. And if we live it well, it's its own message. OK, so let's get on to this question. How can on care for our common home become a world vision? So, papal encyclicals. And one of the things I need to do for a few minutes here is I know I need to establish context. I need to find out what you know about these sorts of things. Hopefully that will spark your interest if you you don't know about them. Okay, do you know what an encyclical is? Professor Henkels used the term encyclical. Okay, The the Greek word comes from the word for circle. An encyclical is a circular letter. I take it you've heard of the documents from the New Testament? Okay? So, most of those, are the letters in there, they were circular letters. They were meant to be read and passed on. So you keep the cycle going. So what more modern, what more modern writers have done is taken that idea, and popes, starting in 1740, I believe it was, started sending circular letters. And the idea is to pass them on. Of course, by that point, we had um, the printing press, and that made it a lot easier to pass on. Back in the day of St. Paul and St. Peter and the early Christians, they had to write them all out, up until about the middle of the uh, late part of the 15th century. Okay, so... An encyclical letter, then, is a letter that is passed on, written. And um, those letters have become, some of them have become relatively famous. Okay, I'm going to point out just a few names, and um, because I, I'm not going to be doing a history of that, I'm going to be focusing on one particular document, namely the most recent one, on care for our, our common home. But these have, um, have a history, how they got here. So... Um, give me a brief understanding, again, context. 1890s, what did economics look like, especially for people who were poor? 1890s. Depression, depression, yeah. And there was, uh, actually, in 1892, I think there was cycles, okay. Industrial Revolution. Okay, by this point, the Industrial Revolution had made some people very wealthy and others very poor. And so what Pope Leo XIII did in 1891 was he wrote an encyclical. The first one is called uh, On uh, of New Things, Rerum Novarum. We we tend, in in the Catholic circles, we tend to use the Latin word because those are how the documents are named. But I'm going to use the English word because it's probably been a while since you've taken a class in Latin or heard a lecture in Latin. I couldn't do it so well, but I mean, I could could read it all right. But the idea is of new things. So he was analyzing the economics of the 1890s, so 1891. And he called it on of, of, of new things. So clearly, this was a new understanding, taking a church understanding, a Catholic understanding of the situation in the world and analyzing it through that perspective. OK, and it turns out it started to change how people perceived what principles we use to guide our life. So the next one that was done in this cycle, popes write lots of documents. I think one time I did a retreat, and I think I found a list of 25 different types of documents that come out from the Vatican. 
These are in, in terms of their breadth of coverage at the top of the list or at or near the top of the list. The reason is they're meant for the whole world. Okay, whereas many of the documents are just one, uh, a bishop or somebody in the Vatican writing to somebody else, it's much lo lower level. These documents are written for the whole world. Okay, the next one in this cycle came out and it was called the 40th year. So the first one was written in 1891, the 40th year was 1931. The picture had changed a lot in those 40 years. One of the big things that came up was dictatorships. Mussolini was in power, Hitler was soon to come in power. Okay, so taking some of the same principles and applying them and then adapting them. So each of these documents, as these documents developed, certain ideas became prevalent and other ideas died out. For example, if you have an edition of a book, if you're reading a sixth edition, a seventh edition, would you refer back to the first edition and say that's the definitive statement? I would hope not. You might not pass the class, okay? You use the current edition. Okay, so if the current edition in this case is 2015, we can make reference to what was there before. But it's like um, you're building up and you're making progress, moving upward, developing. The ideas that are less significant will tend to die away. The ideas that are more significant will tend to be carried on. Same sort of thing when you have editions of books. So I'm just going to go through a few of them, um, a few more, and then we're going to move on to this particular document. The next major one that came out was in 1961 called Mother and Teacher, Mater et Magistra, and it went from a principal focus on Europe starting to focus on the world. The next significant one, next one that came out, was called Peace on Earth, Pachim in Terrace, 1963. It was written just after the Cuban Missile Crisis. How significant is that? What was the, how significant was the Cuban Missile Crisis? Very significant. It was the closest we ever came to nuclear war. Okay, that was very significant. Pope John, now called St. John the 23rd, was on his deathbed, and still he wrote this document because he realized a pope is a moral teacher, and he needed to make a major statement about peace in the world. Okay, so even though he was dying, he summoned the strength to, to write this document. Okay, a number of other documents um, on human labor, 18, 1981, and then the Social Concern, 1987, Centesimus Annus, the 100th year, 1991. Okay, so that was the 100th anniversary of this cycle of documents. And this particular document, so it's Pope John Paul II, or we now call him St. John Paul II, he wrote on that particular topic. So he's continuing the ideas. And like I said, each one, like when you go through editions of a book, they tend to get better and better. The things that perdure, the things that are worth keeping, are kept, and the things that are of lesser value are left, and they keep making progress. Okay, and then Pope Benedict XVI wrote a number of documents that kept building on this theme, and then we come up to Pope Francis. One of the things that I've noted, I've not read all of them, but I've read enough of them to know that in the previous documents, the emphasis was economics, okay? I graduated from the University of Puget Sound, 1981, and I did my honors thesis bringing together economics and ecology and looking at economics from the perspective of ecology. The, word, the Greek word oikos, house, begins both of them. Economics, study of our house, and ecology, the, the study of our home, the broader, in other words, our world. Okay, so it turns out in 1981, I was fortunate to give a talk at Yale University. I was on an international student pugwash. That's, uh, it has to do with um, nuclear, reducing nuclear weapons or eliminating nuclear weapons. So I was, I was giving a, one of the people giving presentations. We had a number of students there, and I was asked to, to each of those were asked to give a, a paper. And I, so I took my thesis and I just shortened it down and I focused on it. Let me be very clear. 
it was not well received. Why was it not well received? It's because it was heretical in a number of ways. I was challenging everyone in the audience or anyone who would read it to look at our economy as a failed economy. Well, for those who are wealthy, it's not a failed economy. But for those who are poor and getting poorer, it is a failed economy. And now when we put it into the whole global perspective, we can see that economics depends on ecology. And if we damage our ecology, what ultimately happens to our economics? It's damaged as well. We see that happening now. We certainly see that happening now. So this is the context in which Pope Francis is writing, recognizing that talking about economics is a good thing, but we need to broaden the circle. We need to look at how economics is affected by ecology and how ecology is affected by economics. OK, so if we look up in here, how can care, on care for our common home, Laudato Si is the name of it, become a world vision? And I'm going to give the simple answer right now, and I'm just simply going to expand on that. The simple answer is through hope in the common good. Hope in the common good. Does that make any common good? What would that sound like? The good? What we're trying to do, we, we hope, is good. We're aiming for things that are good and getting better. The common good is what we hold together, what we hold in common. OK, so searching for, seeking the common good means that we're working together toward a positive end. And then hope. Why did I use the word hope? One of the things I've discovered that we do as monks is we pray quite a bit. I hope that's not shocking for anyone. Nobody's fainting on me. That's a good sign. OK. Well, we're not the only ones who pray. Everyone is welcome to pray. Praying is a good thing, asking for guidance. A document 246 paragraphs long, so 10 to 20 lines per, per paragraph. I went, whoa, how can I go through this and make sense of it for this particular audience? And the word came to me, hope. So I looked in the document, and I found the word hope. And I went, whoa. Toward the beginning of the document, we have the word hope. Several places in the middle and toward the end. And not, not only that, but significant elements of the document come out surrounding the word hope. I went, thank you, Lord. Another prayer heard. OK, so before we get on to hope, I'm going to make a contrast here. OK, I was reading through, and about the sixth grade, I started looking in Scientific American. And just it was something we had a particularly good professor. In fact, I discovered later, he had also studied at the University of Puget Sound, a sixth grade teacher, I should say, Mr. Parnell, passed away some years ago. But he inspired us with a love of science. And while, while I tried to study science and didn't do so well at it, my niece did. 30 years after me, she graduated from University of Puget Sound with a degree in bio, biochemistry, uh, a program of studies. I actually started in, econ, in uh, ecology studies, or environmental science, and it nearly did me in. So I let that go, and I went and studied economics and then became a Peace Corps volunteer, but certainly kept an interest in science. So here I am looking through this month's Scientific American, and what do I see? An article called Preventing Tomorrow's Climate Wars. And here's the summary. Climate change is accelerating instability in certain regions and multiplying, multiplying challenges in others. OK? I take it that's no surprise here. It's written from the perspective of the Department of Defense. OK, so the Department of Defense is writing about this, and are actually people who study what the Department of Defense is doing. And what they're trying to do, this is my favorite. I was a Peace Corps volunteer. Here's my favorite sentence in the entire document. It says, the military has not suddenly become an arm of the Peace Corps. 
I didn't write that. They put that in themselves. I'm going to go, wow, that's fabulous. Okay. Its mission is to safeguard U.S. interests around the world. Protecting human lives can prevent struggling countries from becoming failed states. Okay? So, one of the things that I want to do very clearly is to separate myself from a political perspective. Because in a political perspective, I would say it's the church against the military. And that is not how the church operates. The church seeks the common good. Okay, so I can see merit in what the Department of Defense is trying to do. But I can also see a broader perspective which would benefit the Department of Defense not only of our country but of other countries. So rather than doing something which is simply going to defend the interests of the United States, why not seek the common good? Why not do something which is going to support the interests and the good of the whole world? Trust me, we cannot do that on our own. We simply cannot. But together, we can achieve great things. God has so designed the world that when we join together, we can do great things. So let's look at this first paragraph. And this is right toward the beginning. Pope Francis is laying out what he's going to talk about in this encyclical. So let's just look at the first paragraph. It is my hope, notice I've underlined hope. It is my hope that this encyclical letter, which is now added to the body of the church's social teaching, can help us to acknowledge the appeal, immensity, and urgency of the challenge we face. Clearly an understatement. Okay, continuing. So then what he does there, he presents an overview in that particular paragraph and says, finally, convinced as I am that change is impossible without motivation and a process of education. We're at an educational institution. What a better place to talk about a process of education. And that word motivation. For those who are taking notes, I'm, I'm going to ask you to write this down and just put this down. I'm going to talk about something called the climate within. What does that seem to mean, the climate within? Does that mean the climate of this room? How about the climate in our own hearts, in our own minds, our motivation? So that word motivation, that I'm saying is the climate within. The climate within is not the climate without. The climate without, the world that in which we live, is, we believe, is affected by our decisions. But our decisions come from our motivations, from the climate within. For those who are inclined to view it from this perspective, I would describe the climate within as spirituality. What is it that motivates me? That is the climate within. The climate without, the world in which we live, is affected by the decisions that we make based on our motivations. What is in my heart and in my mind, that is the climate within. So if we're going to affect change outside of ourselves and outside of our communities, we need to start by taking a serious look within. Why do I buy the things I buy? When I've talked about these sorts of topics, I've emphasized the fact one of the simplest ways that we can affect the world economy is what we purchase at a grocery store. Right? Because it, at a grocery store, we will buy things from around the world. And I'm not encouraging you to uh, examine you know, minute, mo uh, minute motivations, but to be aware and prudently making decisions about what is and what is not significant. Okay, Looking at the climate within. What motivates me to the purchases that I make? And we're in an educational institution. We need to ask questions. If we're truly becoming educated, we need to ask questions like, how does this purchase affect the broader picture? Especially when we buy something significant. I think we need to ask those ethical questions. 
How does my motivations affect the world in which we live? And how do our motivations affect the world in which we live? I think those are significant questions. Let's continue on here. OK, the next paragraph. And notice that the paragraphs are numbered. That's the way papal documents do that. Excuse me. OK, paragraph 61. On many concrete questions, the church has no reason to offer a definitive opinion. She knows that honest debate must be encouraged among experts while respecting divergent views. I think you've had some of that already in terms of the, just this particular conference of climate change and bringing in a policy perspective and a science perspective, and they don't necessarily line up. But if we're going to work together, we need to understand the truth together and then approach it in, from a common perspective. Continuing on. But we need only take a frank look at the facts to see that our common home is falling into serious disrepair. Is there anybody who's going to argue against that perspective? Our common home is falling into serious disrepair. OK, I think that is a true statement. Continuing on, remember I said emphasizing the word hope. Hope would have us recognize that there is always a way out, that we can always redirect our steps, that we can always do something to solve our problems. It's not a hopeless situation. It's a mess. It's a very challenging situation, but it's not hopeless. Continuing on. We can see signs that things are now reaching a breaking point due to the rapid pace of change and degradation. These are evident in large-scale natural disasters as well as social and even financial crises, for the world's problems cannot be analyzed or explained in isolation. We're talking about the common good. We're talking about coming to a perspective that we can understand and pursue together. It is far bigger than any individual, far bigger than any group. But if we work together, we can make positive change. Is that hopeful? I pray that it is. A hopeful vision. Let's continue. Paragraph 71. I, I just took this one sentence out. All it takes is one good person to restore hope. That, I hope, is a hopeful statement all by itself. One good person can inspire other people to the good. Continuing on. The God who created the universe out of nothing can also intervene in this world and overcome every form of evil. Injustice is not invincible. Does that sound like a realistic perspective? I ask you to reflect on that. That is part of the, the climate within. Being aware of statements like that. A spirituality. What is my spirituality? And we all have spiritualities. All of us have something that motivated us here, for example, to this particular, and let's hope it's not fear. Let's hope it's something that it's really something that we have a desire to be here. OK? But. What is my spirituality, I think, is an important question. What are my motivations? That, I think, is a very important question. Continuing on. Skipping up to paragraph 142. If everything is related, and by the way, that's a statement. If, if one were to read through this document, he says everything is connected, everything is related. He says it in a number of different ways. But if everything is related, then the health of society's institutions has consequences for the environment and the quality of human life. I take it that's not a point of discussion or debate. That's, that's a point that we can accept. Every violation of solidarity and civic friendship harms the environment. So our decisions can positively or negatively affect the environment. In this sense, social ecology, which is a term that he develops in this document, in this sense, social ecology is necessarily institutional and gradually extends to the whole of society, from the primary social group, the family, and that is very much a Catholic and a Christian perspective, the smallest Social grouping is the family. 
It's like a building block. Everything builds from there. And then it continues to the wider local, national, and international communities. So ultimately, we are all one family, starting from very small units. OK. Is this starting to form a picture for you for how Pope Francis is approaching much more than climate change? He's approaching how we live in the world, what motivates us, what we are aiming for, what our purpose is in life, and how we ask that together. OK. Paragraph 154. Respect for our dignity as human beings often jars with the chaotic realities that people have to endure in city life. Have any of you been to a mega city, 10 million people or more? Yeah? I've only been to one. I've been to Cairo. I don't know about you. That certainly jars me. That's, it's just, actually, I've been to two. I've been to Mexico City and Cairo. Gigantic. Mexico City is 20 million people. Cairo at that point was 12 or, 15, 12 or 13 million people. That's a whole lot of people. Okay, that's a whole lot of people. And so having to endure city life, that can be a real challenge. Continuing on. By the way, Pope Francis is the first pope who came from a mega city. Buenos Aires is a city of over 10 million people. Continuing on. Yet this should not make us overlook the abandonment and neglect also experienced by some rural populations which lack access to essential services and where some workers are reduced to conditions of servitude, read slavery, without rights or even the hope of a more dignified life. If we have very wealthy people in one part of the world, it can only happen because we have very poor people in other parts of the world supplying them. This is why I do not like to shop at Walmart. OK? Because the only way you can have low, low, low prices here is if people are paid low, low, low wages there. Is that an ethical statement? Is that a realistic challenge? By the way, I had the opportunity, I was traveling through northwest Arkansas and southwest Missouri, and in northwest Arkansas, I went by and set a sign, the original Walmart store, and I just said a prayer and kept driving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, you will not find the, the term climate within developed in the document. It's a term that I, another person and I came up with. I'm doing some work with the Archdiocese of Portland, so that's Western Oregon. And a man named Matt Cato is the Director of Life, Justice, and Peace for the Archdiocese of Portland. And he, I've been working with him. We were interviewed on KBVM, the Catholic radio station in Willamette Valley. And that's how we got to meet each other. And he, he's invited me now to talk at a couple different events. Next one will be on the 11th of June. And we're, and we're going to be using this idea of the climate within, looking at the motivations, the spirituality. OK, but, but it's, it's applicable in broader sense than that. Let's take a look at just a couple of these. This, um, so the climate within is not found in the document, and thought unit is not found in the document. It just it seemed to make sense. But these next three paragraphs, I'm just going to go through one because we're running, starting to run low on time here. So I'm just going to go through one, and you can see that there's segments of this document that have certain topics. So let's look at paragraph 165. We know that technology based on the use of highly polluting fossil fuels, especially coal, but also oil, and to a lesser degree gas, needs to be progressively replaced without delay. For many in the world, that would be a heretical statement. But Pope Francis didn't write it based on his own input. He had, uh, in fact, there was a Cardinal Turkson from Ghana, who was the one who wrote the original document, and the Pope had him rearranged. He says, we need to start off this document so that it speaks to people throughout the world, so it's written for uh, the common people. It's written for all people of goodwill. And so he had it written with that, those statements, the general statements first, and it only got to the Christian statements toward the end of the document. So the idea is that somebody could pick this up and find value in it, okay, and regardless of their belief structure. Okay, 
But so that's a, that's a pretty radical statement, quite frankly. And as many in the church, I would have to state, quite frankly, who would disagree with it. But he didn't write it on his own. He collected the best input he could from, for example, the Pope Papal uh, Academy of Social so or, uh, Sciences. And he says, this seems to be the case, and this is what we're writing about. Continuing on, although the post-industrial period may well be remembered as one of the most irresponsible in history, notice a serious criticism, but stated respectfully. And you'll find that throughout the document. Serious criticism stated respectfully. Continuing, nonetheless, there is reason to hope that humanity at the dawn of the 21st century will be remembered for having generously shouldered its Grave responsibilities. One of the things that deeply impressed me by this document is that Pope Francis was able to say, basically, this should not be going on. We recognize that it is. And state it respectfully, not throwing mud, not making accusations, but saying, this shouldn't go on. Let's try a different path. Let's find a path which is going to serve the common good. Let's find a path which is consistent with our ecology. Let's find a path that builds human life rather than strengthens it in some parts of the world and destroys it in other parts of the world. Moving on to the next section. OK, another thought unit. Paragraph 189. Politics must not be subject to the economy, nor should the economy be subject to the dictates of an efficiency-driven paradigm of technocracy. Whoa. Let's try that statement again. That's a rather dense statement. Politics and economy. No surprise to me, they're all guided by human beings. They need to work together. So politics must not be subject to the economy, nor should the economy be subject to the dictates of efficiency. Efficiency can be a good thing. For example, if you're studying for finals, how many here are studying for finals? Several people here in the room? OK, quite a few. Efficiency at this point in the semester becomes very important. The things that one may have wanted to do at the beginning of the semester, suddenly we find them flying out the window because the things that need to get done is what I need to focus on. That's a focus on efficiency, and that's a good thing. But efficiency, when it damages the lives of other people, is not searching for or finding the common good. Right? If other people need to be written off because they're not part of my efficiency. My efficiency is not serving our world. It's helping to destroy our world. In a different document, this is actually not spelled right, it should have an and their Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel. He presents four principles for peacemaking. And actually, I presented this to Gary Spanovich's group, the Holistic Peace Institute, based in Portland. They bring Nobel Peace Prize winners to Oregon to talk about peace in a variety of educational settings. OK, I gave this talk there. This, um, if that interests you, the joy of the gospel has four principles for peacemaking. Time is greater than space. So in other words, don't fight about it. Give it time to work out. Unity prevails over conflict. If we're going to resolve problems, we need to work together. Three, realities are more important than ideas. I would think in an educational institution, that's no surprising statement. We need to work in terms of realities. I've often said, I have found it far preferable to bend my will to reality rather than trying to bend reality to my will. I think that's just a very practical, realistic statement. Number four, the whole is greater than the part. OK, so parts are important, but they constitute a whole picture. That can involve peacemaking at any level, between two people, between two continents. It's just, I, I think it's, just, it's a brilliant, it's a very brilliant analysis. Simple statements, very realistic, and can be applied very broadly. Last two groups here. 
214, 244. So 214, political institutions and various other social groups are also entrusted with helping to raise people's awareness. So too is the church. All Christian communities have an important role to play in, educate, in uh, ecological education. I believe all, ecolog all educational institutions have a role to play. Remember, this is toward the end of the document. So he's gone from the general statements that apply to all people of goodwill, believers in God in whatever form, to toward the end he's writing mostly to Christians. But the, the basic principle applies, is that education is a very important part of this entire picture. Paragraph 244, in the meantime, we come together to take charge of this home which has been entrusted to us. The earth as a home. S Chief Seattle famously said, the earth is not given to us. We have borrowed it from our children. Pope Francis talks about the same kinds of ideas here, right? talking about intergender. So what we leave on is a legacy. That's very important. Continuing on. In union with all creatures, we journey through this land seeking God. For if the world has a beginning and if it has been created, we must inquire who gave it this beginning and who was its creator. Let us sing as we go. May our struggles and our concern for this planet never take away the joy of our hope. Okay, and then the final paragraph, there's just at the conclusion of this lengthy reflection, depending on the, the era in which you can change font sizes, at least 100 pages if you're going to be able to read it. It's more than that, and um, it can be either easily longer than that. But at the conclusion of this lengthy reflection, which has been both joyful and troubling, I propose that we offer two prayers. I'm not going to give the prayers. One is a prayer to all believers. And then the other is a Christian prayer. Interestingly enough, not a Catholic prayer. Because he's trying to write for all of Christianity and all believers in the world, all people of goodwill. So the first, the prayer for all believers, we can share with all who believe in a God who is the all-powerful creator, while in the other, we Christians ask for inspiration to take up the commitment to creation set before us by the gospel of Jesus. Okay. So now let's go back to our focus question and see if I have given you a focus question that's worth reflecting on. How can On Care for Our Common Home, this document, become a world vision? Have I at least convinced you of this much? It's worthy of consideration as a possible world vision. Would anyone disagree with that statement? I think that this statement of Pope Francis, drawn from centuries, in this case, of Christian teaching, okay, and as I said, the, method, the idea of progress, as we progress through editions of a book, we, we ask that it become better and better. Okay, well, it's the same sort of thing with Catholic social teaching, that the current document says things better than the original, than the previous documents did. And it, the next one will be better than this. Although this is a pretty substantial step forward, I'd have to say. But how can on care for our common home, that document, Laudato Si, it's a statement that um, the name actually comes from St. Francis of Assisi. It was a hymn that he wrote, and it was in medieval Italian, and Laudato Si is praise be to you. But how can on care for our common home become a world vision? And my basic answer is through hope in the common good. If we don't give up hope, if we are willing to work together, we can make the changes we need to make. It is a difficult situation, and the Pope points out that points that out very clearly. But he doesn't abandon hope. If we work together, we can make the necessary changes. And please. I'm just curious, was the document originally written in English? No. I think it was written in, um, in Italian. Okay. 
or uh, probably in Italian. And then uh, the Vatican has lots of translators. When this document, when a Vatican document comes out, so thank you. So what, what was the original language? I'm fairly certain the original language was Italian, spiced in with Spanish, but you know they did it in one particular. Uh, uh, one particular language. And then what the Vatican does is before it's published, they'll have it translated into like 10 different languages. Okay, so certainly will be in English, Spanish, Italian, it'll be in French, German, Portuguese, and then depending on the audience, it can be in a variety of other languages, and it will always have one document will be written in Latin. And the reason is that's a language which doesn't belong to any country, and a language which is considered the common, the common source for the Vatican. It used to be the documents were written in Latin and then translated. That in, in, the, in recent decades, that's not been the case because there aren't that many people who can think in Latin. I've met very few who could literally think in Latin. Okay, okay thank you for that interesting question. Any other questions, comments? Please. So what would be the base? What reason do we have to hope? Can we look around the world and find situations where countries have lived within the bounds of creation and done so well. Does anything come to mind for you? Yeah, a, a country that would live, I, one comes to mind quite quickly for me, but then, okay. Perfect, that was exactly what I'm thinking. Isn't that interesting? Okay, I had the opportunity Para vivir en Costa Rica por dos meses para estudiar español. I studied Spanish in Costa Rica in 1993. It was really quite wonderful. Costa Rica is a small country in Central America, just north of Panama, just now south of Nicaragua. And it has, it's about the size of West Virginia. There are 12 bioecological zones in Costa Rica. There's about 34 in the entire world. 12 of them are in Costa Rica like the big island of Hawaii, has about the same, okay? So Costa Rica is a country that said, we could do like the countries to the north of us, to the south of us, and cut down our forests, or we can use them for ecological tourism and preserving our ecology. So Costa Rica is in a number of ways, they call themselves La Suiza de América Central, the Switzerland of Central America. So Costa Rica, there would be other examples as well, but that is one that comes to mind. A country which honors its ecological heritage and continues to build on it. And then in this case, I don't think they intend to do that, but they become an international model for how to live well within one's ecological bounds. I think that's a fine question to end on here. So thank you for asking that question.